this is such a classic series for understanding why it's so important not to overreact to one game or to two games. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's the wrinkle of them having fallen down 3-0 and that being something that's never been done before. But in game three, Toronto played really well. And honestly, it came down to particularly Siakam and Van Vliet really struggling offensively to the point where they couldn't close the deal in that game. Way too much was on you know, Gary Trent Jr. to make plays or OG Ananobi to make plays. But the truth is, is like, if you were to watch the first two games of that series and then watched game four and five, they could, they are massively unrecognizable between the two the two stretches of games. And it's because in a playoff series, so much can change. We talked about this at the beginning. I said the theme of the show was styles make fights, but that the st- it's about the style that wins the fight. Well, coming into this series, we talked at length about how Joel Embiid and James Harden were the best two players in the series, probably that that uh, Philly had more talent, that they should win, but they had some specific flaws. One, their transition defense. Two, Joel Embiid's ability to handle double teams. J- uh, three, James Harden and his ability to score in single coverage. And then four, Joel Embiid and James Harden in a driving kick system. Those were my four big gaping holes that I saw in this Philly roster. So what sucks is those advantages, Toronto was completely geared and equipped to inflict on Philly. They had all the length and athleticism to cause James Harden problems and to cause MB problems in double teams. All the length and athleticism to get up in floor and transition, to get into driving kick scenarios where they can take advantage of their lack of foot speed. They had all of that. They had the coach to do it too, but they just did it. In the first two games of the series, the Raptors allowed 135.8 points per 100 possessions. In the first two games of the series, the Sixers ran them off the floor in transition. So the same thing that they should have been doing to Philly happened to them. So even though Toronto had advantages, Philly was playing so well and Toronto was playing so poorly that none of that materialized and they got their ass kicked. In the three games since, the Sixers are being held to 102 points per uh, per 100 possessions. Literally 33 points fewer, more than 33 fewer points per 100 possessions compared to the first two games of the series. Toronto's just playing better, man. Huge part of it. I mean, Fred Van Vliet is their best perimeter initiator. Fred Van Vliet is a very good defensive player at the guard position, but he's small. And there are, there's all these different ways that we look at defense and You know, in isolation defense, Van Vliet's ability to get up underneath you and slide his feet and be physical is valuable. But covering ground in rotation, there's a ceiling there for Van Vliet. He's small. He can't cover as much ground. So they take Van Vliet out of the lineup. All of a sudden, Gary Trent Jr., who is 6'5 without shoes on, Gary Trent Jr. was the smallest player they played. Everybody else other than him is massive, long, and athletic. So suddenly, Toronto looks a lot more imposing defensively just because of the lineups that they're going with. There was a really, really, really interesting sequence late fourth quarter, or excuse me, uh, middle third quarter of game five. Of game, uh, yeah, of game five. So you guys have probably seen this clip. It was going around social media like crazy. And I specifically have been on this train all season long. So of course I have to bring it up tonight. I talked to you guys about how I love Joel Joel Embiid's game, and I love Nikola Jokic's game, but I could never include them in the list of best players in the league because as dominant as they are at their position, they have foot speed limitations that you can target specifically in transition and in five-out scenarios. Well, one of the things that Toronto has figured out so far in this series as it's progressed is Joel Embiid can't guard their quick forwards on the perimeter. Pretty average players. So there was a sequence in the third quarter where on five consecutive possessions in isolation, not like, oh, he's attacking a closeout, not like, oh, Joel Embiid was helping on someone else and had to step over and was at a disadvantage. No, staring Joel Embiid in the eye and driving to the basket on it. First play, Precious Achua faces up at the foul line, does a jab step, Joel Embiid buckles, drives to the basket, draws a foul. 
Very next play, OG Ananobi kind of like fakes like he's going to use a screen and roll. Joel Embiid has dropped way off of him like 10 feet. OG hits the gas and punches the gap, blows right by Embiid for a dunk. Next possession, kind of semi-transition. Man, man on man, there's no help. It's just Joel Embiid on an island with Precious Achua. Precious Achua just does a through-the-legs dribble and just blows by Embiid. No chance, wide open layup. Next possession, same exact thing. Pascal Siakam on the right wing just drives by right by Joel Embiid for a layup. And then finally, on the fifth consecutive possession, out of the left corner, Precious Achua drives on Embiid. Embiid actually makes him use a counter move this time. But Precious just up fakes and goes up and under and makes a layup on the left side of the rim. Five consecutive possessions where they scored on Joel Embiid in isolation situations because their players are faster. And that, again, is Precious Achua, OG Ananobi, and Pascal Siakam. All very good basketball players. None of them are dominant offensive engines. And Joel and B can't guard them on the perimeter. It's just a limitation in their individual games. Jokic and Embiid. Not a criticism of them as like they're not top 10 players or they don't deserve to win MVP or any of those things. Just why I personally am always going to lean towards a Giannis or a LeBron or a KD is because if you put them in that type of setting, a game that goes up and down or a game that's stuck in the half court, a game that's five out or a game that's more traditional with, you know, a lot of pick and roll and guys underneath the basket with less, less spacing. They can thrive in all of those environments. With jo Jokic and Embiid, if the style exits their comfort zone, they have shortcomings. And you're seeing Toronto attack that. Another big part here in the series, we talked about how there was no way in the world that – James Harden, or that the, the Raptors could not have one of the top two or three players in the series and win. They would need to. And through the first two games, I would argue Embiid was the best player, Maxi was the second best player, and Harden was the third best player before we got to a single Raptor. Well, Maxi's cooled off. Last three games, 14 points on 39% from the field, 18% from three. Harden looks like the same guy he has for the last three months, like a totally fine secondary creator who can – make passes out of pick and roll and stuff, but he's not a great isolation player anymore. He's not doing well in spot-up situations, and he's really bad defensively, so there's a lot of limitations there. Here's the reality of the situation. There's two games left. Embiid, uh, Embiid is the best player in the series. The Sixers have more talent, and they have one of those games at home. So the Sixers should win. But there's a ton of pressure on them now. They have to start by going up to Toronto. If you lose that game in Toronto, which Toronto... It's like probably like a coin flip, right? If Toronto wins game six, now you're coming home, but there's a boatload of pressure. And we've seen how James Harden reacts in those situations. I'm still seeing Joel Embiid rely too much on foul grifting. One last note on this series. One of the things that I noticed when I watched the tape this morning, Joel Embiid is starting to be relegated a little bit to the perimeter on offense. He's having some success in situations where he's off ball and he happens to catch around the rim and he's still as dominant as ever there. It's a bucket or a foul every time, basically. But the post-ups with Embiid, Toronto's figured him out. They're getting the ball out of his hand. He's not getting good stuff out of that anymore. Down the stretch of game five, Embiid was kind of floating around the perimeter, getting rid of the basketball, doing a lot more dribble handoffs, taking a lot of tougher jump shots. It's an interesting dynamic. You're starting to see... You know, early in the series, guys like Precious Achua, Kem Birch, and OG and uh, OG Ananobi and Pascal, I mean, all of them have seen time on Embiid. But each of them, at the beginning of the series, were super tentative. They didn't want to commit fouls. They weren't being physical. They weren't testing his handle. They're kind of feeling things out. Watch the way they're guarding Embiid now. They're testing his handle. They're reaching. They're being aggressive. They're getting up underneath him. They're starting to have some success there. So, like... If there was ever a time that this, uh, earlier I was just wishing it would happen. Now this is a real potential outcome. Toronto has a game at home, a chance to win, and then game seven in, uh, in Philly, anything can happen. This thing is still up in the air, although I am still picking Philly because they are the better team.